Okay, can, can everyone hear me? No? Not fun now. I think it's on, no? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chang Hoon Han. You can call me Chang. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Princeton. Uh, so, Um, so Pablo gave a very nice talk talking about my work with uh, Simbig. So I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. That is my recent work demonstrating we can constrain cosmology with just galaxy photometry alone. Um, so I'm sure everyone in the audience. Uh, is familiar with this paper uh, that Paco wrote, this nice paper from a few years ago, Cosmology with One Galaxy, that demonstrated that with just the internal properties of a single galaxy, you can constrain uh, cosmological parameters like omega matter to significant precision. Um, so what ultimately uh, this paper found is that you can constrain the, prob uh, the probability distribution of cosmological parameters like omega matter and sigma eight given the galaxy properties like the circular velocity of a galaxy, the stellar mass, the gas mass, or the metallicity. Um, and so this is a nice figure illustrating their results, uh, which is on the x-axis is the true omega matter value of test galaxies, and on the y-axis is the inferred omega matter value from their moment at work. And one of the things that this figure nicely illustrates is that if they're able to derive unbiased omega matter constraints and also get precision that's uh, pretty interesting of uh, roughly 10%. Um, and they provide some interpretation of this result, one of them, which is that uh, these galaxy properties lie on some low dimensional manifold that you can exploit in order to get to the cosmological information. Um, another interpretation is that you're ultimately measuring some ratio between omega matter and omega baryon that you're approximating as the total mass over the baryonic mass. So um, you're getting the total mass from galaxy properties like circular velocity, and then you're getting the baryon mass from which corresponds to the stellar mass divided by some star formation efficiency, which is provided by uh, other galaxy properties that I've included there. So like many ideas, this is not anything new. Uh, this is almost uh, 30 years old. A very similar approach was used uh, way back in the day with, uh, with a pretty similar idea, but on galaxy clusters. Um, and so despite this nice demonstration, one of the main challenges uh, that we have faced when trying to apply this to actual practice is that the galaxy properties that I've mentioned, they're not observables of galaxies. So the question still remains, can we constrain cosmology with actual observables like photometry or spectra of just a single galaxy? So before I address that question, um, let me take a step back and um, take a look at the CAMEL simulations. So CAMEL takes these input parameters, which are the cosmological parameters, omega matter and sigma eight, and also the hydrodynamical parameters that uh, dictate the supernova and AGN feedback. You uh, put these parameters into some galaxy formation model like TNG or Simba, and they produce the galaxy properties that I mentioned earlier. But we can actually go a step farther than this, uh, than CAMELS and forward model uh, the actual observables from these galaxy properties. For example, we can use stellar population synthesis and go from the star formation histories and the chemical enrichment histories to the SEDs of galaxies, apply dust attenuation to the SD, SEDs, and then apply some realistic noise to get photometry, uh, forward model photometry of all of the CAMELS galaxies. So we can rewrite each of these steps as these following distributions. The first is the galaxy formation model, which we can write as the distribution of galaxy properties given the input parameters. And then the forward model is the distribution of the uh, observable given the properties. So then when we're inferring um, this posterior here, the posterior of the input parameters given the photometry, we can write that ultimately becomes just solving the inverse problem of this forward model. So we can write this uh, as this following expression sort of based on these, uh, these distributions. So if we focus on that expression, uh, well, what I wanna point out is that the first term is actually just the results from Paco's paper, which is cosmology with one galaxy. And the second term here is just the output of a typical SED modeling. So the probability distribution of galaxy properties given some observable. So in principle, you can probably take the output from Paco's paper, take your favorite SED model, uh, posterior from that, and then try to evaluate this integral. 
But fortunately, we have camels and we have machine learning, we have neural density estimation, so we can do this much more directly. So we can actually just estimate that posterior directly using some model a Q with hyperparameters phi. So one way we can do this is by trying to minimize the KL divergence between the true posterior and our estimate. Um, this has the nice advantage that it's very easy to evaluate uh, because you can rewrite this as the sum of the log uh, likelihood of, of Q, uh, where this value is just evaluated using the galaxies in your camel's forward model. So the only thing you need is a model that's uh, easy to evaluate and that's flexible. So um, normalizing flows has been mentioned in, in throughout this conference, but this is the model that we use uh, and uh, it, it provides both, it's both easy to evaluate and also very flexible. I'm not gonna go into any detail other than saying that it's a series of invertible and differentiable transformations from some base distribution to some complicated target distribution. Um, and I'll just give you a demonstration of how flexible it is. Here's a 3D point cloud, uh, which with a normalizing flow, you can transform into airplanes, chairs, or cars here. And again, this is just to make the point that it's very, very flexible and can describe complicated probability distributions. So let's go back to the setup that I was describing earlier. Um, so we have the camel's forward model. So we have uh, a way of going from the input parameters, including the cosmological parameters to the hydrodynamical simulations, and then to the simulated uh, forward model photometry of galaxies. We can use that data then to train a normalizing flow to estimate the posterior. And then once we have the train normalizing flow, uh, what we do is we validate it to make sure that it's actually uh, able to derive or infer the posteriors correctly. So we would take test galaxies that were excluded from our training and then uh, take their test pho uh, photometry of these galaxies, plug it into our normalizing flow, then derive posteriors like the one I'm showing you in blue, compare it to the true values and then uh, validate it this way. So this is one example. Here's another example. Here's another example. We do this 10,000 different, uh, 10,000 times and then we can use something like uh, the test that Pablo mentioned, the coverage tests, and demonstrate that we're actually able to uh, um, estimate an optimal estimate of the true posterior. Um, so basically, as long as it, uh, the closer it lies to the dashed black line here, the better the estimate. And you can see that we're pretty spot on. Um, so then after we validated it, now we can go ahead and plug in the actual observed photometry and then derive the uh, posterior using uh, the observed photometry of, of galaxies. So when we do this, here's the posterior that we actually get. This is for a single SDSS galaxy using GRIZ band optical photometry. I'm showing you the posterior of cosmological parameters and the four hydrodynamical uh, parameters for supernova and AGN feedback. So if we focus on just the cosmological parameters alone, what we find is that the, a single galaxy, the photometry of a single galaxy contains pretty limited cosmological information. Um, but I want to highlight that the amount of information, however, is, is, is not zero. So what that means is since there's some information per galaxy, um, we can combine the constraining power of many galaxies using population inference. So I'm not going to bore you with the derivation of the uh, the, the probabilities, but you can write down the probability, so the posterior of the parameters given a set of galaxy photometry as the following expression. And so then we can apply this, this framework to an actual observational data set like the galaxies in the NASA Sloan Atlas. So I'm showing you here the color distribution of these galaxies in black, um, and we're selecting these objects in the orange. Um, so we can apply this to 22,000 different galaxies. And when we do this, here's the posteriors that we're actually able to derive. So this is the constraints we get on omega matter and sigma eight um, using just galaxy photometry alone. So this is not using any of the positional information uh, that was used, for instance, by SIMBIG or galaxy clustering analysis. So this is a completely independent uh, constraint from that. So, uh, of course, the elephant in the room is that there are obviously some caveats to this analysis, which is that we assume a galaxy formation model, 
Uh, in this, in our case, we assume the TNG. And so this is a figure that's kind of highlighting the issue with that assumption. Uh, I'm showing you this star formation rate versus stellar mass relations of a bunch of uh, different galaxy formation models. And if you look at the bottom right panel there, it's showing you the star forming sequence. And the main point here is that you can see there are significant discrepancies. So this raises serious questions about, oh, how robust is this constraint to our choice of galaxy formation model? And so the advantage, though, of this approach is that, um, to borrow the language from the domain adaptation talk by David Shi, uh, is we can exploit control regions, meaning that we can choose galaxy populations that are the most robust to different galaxy formation models. So this is a figure from uh, the paper that demonstrates this point. Um, we select a star forming galaxy with intermediate stellar mass in TNG and in Simba. And then we look at the posteriors of both, both of those galaxies. And what we find is that the cosmological information in both simulations are nearly identical. So we can systematically do this and select galaxies that are robust to different changes in galaxy formation model. Uh, the other assumption that we make is in the forward model part, which is in the SED model. So this is the equation for uh, uh, how we calculate the SCD. And as you can imagine, there's a number of assumptions that go in there in terms of the stellar evolution theory, the spectral libraries, and the initial mass function. But again, we can exploit this control region idea and focus on galaxies with, for instance, well-established IMFs. We can also target just galaxies with low uh, infrared emission with little dust. And so we can use this strategy to really select the galaxies where we are confident that we can robustly model. And I think the promising, the reason why this approach is promising is that we can afford to be very, very picky because upcoming galaxy surveys like DESI and PFS, they'll observe tens of millions of galaxies. So even if, if we throw out a bunch of these, we'll still be left with thousands of galaxies that we can include into this uh, uh, cosmology with galaxy photometry approach and be able to constrain cosmology quite well. And in particular, I'm very excited about the Desi Bright Galaxy Survey, which will provide a magnitude limited sample, which means a very diverse uh, population of galaxies. And it'll contain, like, I think now it's gonna be like 15 million galaxies. So I think that's a really promising sample. So let me end here with the summary, which is that the photometry of a single galaxy contains some cosmological information. And we can ex really exploit this by using CAMELS, neural density estimation, and hierarchical population inference, uh, and do this by using many, many different <coughs> galaxies. Uh, and I think one of the advantages of this approach is really this control regions where we can really target the, uh, the galaxies that we can robustly model. And I think be with the next generation surveys, this, this will be a really promising approach. Thanks. Questions here in New York. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, so you mentioned that you can be selective with galaxies as far as which ones are well represented by the galaxy formation model in the simulation that you're using to, to train your method. Um, I was curious if independent of that, certain types of galaxies were more informative for the prediction of the cosmological parameters than others? And you know, if so, what types of galaxies and, and why are they better at constraining the cosmology? So I, I think that's an excellent question. We're still looking into this in detail. Uh, we haven't done a systematic search of or a systematic investigation of all different types of galaxies. But for instance, there's a uh, study by Hema, right? Uh, well, so, someone uh, here who looked at void galaxies uh, being particularly informative. And that makes sense because uh, compared to, say, satellite galaxies, you would expect centrals, the galaxy formation model, to be a lot um, simpler. Questions in Paris? Yes, we do have. Hello, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. It's amazing the, the work you've done. Um, do you have plans to use the full cutout, like the galaxy image, as an input to the, to the neural network? So um, we would love to add more information, whether it's spectra, the morphology, all this information. Um, for, and, I, I, and I think the only limiting factor is we can only analyze observables that we can realistically model. 
So if we had forward models of galaxy images that we're confident about, then we can also extract cosmological information uh, from say the, the full image itself. But that's really the main bottleneck. Question on Slack. Johannes Buchner is asking whether you can also use a photometric galaxy uh, samples with photoses, um, because of obviously those catalogs would be much bigger. Yeah, so in this case, uh, in, in the results that I showed, we used a spectroscopic galaxy sample, so we had the spec Cs um, that allowed us to really narrow down um, the simulations we run. Um, but in principle, there's nothing stopping us from doing this with the spectroscopic information. The thing is, in the second part of the, uh, the equation that I showed earlier with the posterior, which is the SCD model, now you're uh, allowing redshift to be free. So when you do that, you'll uh, inevitably reduce the amount of information that you get from that term. Uh, but if the advantage with photometric surveys is that you'll have many, many more galaxies you can analyze than a spectroscopic one. So that is something we're thinking about, uh, but I think it comes with some challenges. More discussions, please go to Slack and let's thank Cheng again. Next up is Sultan.